by Emily Delaney entitled Recurrent Changes to PDM3 Drive Convergent Evolution of Female Limited Polymorphism in the Drosophila Montium subgroup. Montium. Hi, I'm Emily Delaney, and today I'll be telling you about my work with RDM Cop and some of our collaborators studying the role of PDM3 in a sex-limited polymorphism in the Montium subgroup. The main focus of my research is to understand how and why sexual dimorphism evolves. I think it's very fascinating that males and females share so much of their genome in common, and yet they come to such different phenotypic outcomes. In particular, I'm interested in the role that uh, sex-limited gene expression might have in the origin of these new traits. So how does that evolve and why? You can imagine sexual dimorphism evolves in two different ways. In the first, you could have a silencer model where um, an ancestor might lack the trait, for example, horns in this case, that's later gained in both sexes monomorphically um, and then is later modified in one sex through potentially sexually antagonistic selection in females against having horns, leading you to a state of sexual dimorphism. Um, so this would involve the gain monomorphically and then a modifier allele that's sex specific. By contrast, you could imagine avoiding these two steps by studying or by um, the gain of a male specific allele. So if you had an allele that just originated to be male specific, this could also lead to sexual dimorphism. So I'm really interested in how frequently do each of these models occur? Does one occur more often or easier than another? And how do alleles become sex specific in the first place? I think we can make a lot of progress in studying these traits by looking in groups of species or organism or uh, in groups of species where there's variation in this trait. So the Drosophila montium group has more than 76 different species in it. I'm just showing you a few here. What you can see is that there are some species where females come in two different color forms, light or dark on their abdomen, whereas others are just a single color. Most excitingly, males are always a single color in this group. So males can be light or dark, but they're never polymorphic within species. And so just to draw your attention to a few of them, what you can see is that among close relatives, they differ in the presence or absence of female-limited color dimorphism. In cases where we've been able to cross them, what we can show is that female-limited color dimorphism is controlled by a single locus, where the dark allele tends to be dominant in almost all species except Drosophila jambolina. So what is this locus, this autosomal locus, um, and is it the same across all these different species? To figure out what's going on, we first started looking in Drosophila serrata. So we created an introgression mapping population where we took females from the dark lines and crossed them to males from a line that produces only light females. And we introgressed them for 25 generations um, to try to get down to the region that is just controlling pigmentation. So on the right here, I'm showing you light females and dark females from the introgression cross where each female is represented by her genotypes um, as a row, and the columns are showing uh, the different markers. And what you can see is there's a clear break point around this region here, where all light females are homozygous for the light uh, allele, whereas dark females are heterozygous, suggesting something in the 708 KB region is important for female pigmentation. But this is still quite a large region, and so to fine scale map it a little further, we teamed up with Adam Reddix and Steve Chenoweth at the University of Queensland, who've developed a really nice panel of Drosophila serrata, where they've inbred 100 different lines and sequence whole genomes from them. So with these lines, we phenotyped them for female pigmentation and then looked across the genome to see what SNPs were associated with pigmentation. And what we found is only two SNPs in the entire genome were associated with pigmentation. And both of these fell within the region that we predicted from our intergression mapping. Interestingly, both these SNPs fell about 480 bases apart from each other in the first intron of PDM3. So what is PDM3? PDM3 is a pit oct unc gene family member. It's a um, transcription factor with two different binding domains shown here in yellow and fuchsia a past specific and pow homeo domain. This gene was discovered in 2008, and it's been since shown to be involved in sensory systems and neuron development. Um, a trans abdominal screen for pigmentation um, factors recently identified PDM3 as a candidate gene among many involved in pigmentation. However, it's equivocal whether PDM3 was important in activating pigmentation or repressing it. So here I'm presenting some functional data showing that PDM3 appears to repress pigmentation in Drosophila melanogaster. 
So compared to controls on the left, um, on the right, we are showing uh, RNAi knockdown of PDM3 in a pannier gal 4 cross. And so the flies on the right have increased pigmentation relative to the controls. We can similarly knock down gene expression by using a um, transposable element insertion line that interrupts the PAU specific domain. So similarly in these flies, uh, there's an increase in pigmentation suggesting that the normal function of PDM3 in Drosophila melanogaster is to repress pigmentation. I can do the opposite experiment and try to increase the amount of PDM3 present in these flies with, by driving it with an abdominal B GAL4 driver. And what you can see is that the posterior segment gets much lighter in these flies, suggesting again that PDM3 functions to repress pigmentation in melanogaster. So getting back to Drosophila serrata, looking at these two SNPs, I noticed a difference between light and dark lines. Uh, reads from the light lines map very well to the reference genome, whereas reads from the dark line did not. So in this integrative genome viewer plot on the bottom, you can see many of these reads are outlined in red, meaning one of two of the two paired reads maps well to this region, but the other does not. So I took all these reads and reassembled the haplotype in this region. And what I found is shown here in this cartoon, where the dark allele is 333 bases longer than the light allele. Um, I confirmed this with PCR and found that homozygous light females had the short allele, homozygous dark females had the uh, longer allele, and heads had one of each, suggesting there are two discrete alleles in this region. Um, and these were both flanked by the SNPs that we had found. So what is this region? It differs in size, but it also seems to differ in sequence. So if we use a dot plot and compare the two sequences to each other, um, each dot represents 90% similarity match in a 10 pace 10 base pair window. And what you can see is these two alleles have similar flanking sequences, but um, in the intermediate region where this uh, structural variant seems to be, there's um, no sequence homology. And so I think what's happening is that this allele, which differs in size and sequence, might be acting like an inversion and suppressing recombination. So where does it come from? I noticed that this one region shown here, box in blue, seems to have um, a region that seems to be repeated in these dark alleles, um, and potentially formed by tandem duplications. So I used Meme Suite and TomTom to look for motifs that might be enriched within this region unique to the dark allele. And what I found is three motifs that seem to be repeated in sets of three four times, confirming this idea that maybe there is um, repeated duplications of this region right here. Um, and these were fell perfectly within the two SNPs that we found in our GWAS. Uh, most excitingly, one of these motifs, the second one, had a predicted binding sites for abdominal B, which regulates abdominal development, and double sex, which regulates sexual differentiation in Drosophila. So two great candidate genes for female-limited pigmentation trait for the abdomen. We've seen this before, though, um, with the case of Bricobrac. So Bricobrac is a pair of transcription factors that represses pigmentation. Um, it's been shown to be important in melanogaster. And beautiful work by Thomas Williams and co-authors have shown that there's both a monomorphic element in this gene and a dimorphic element. So this monomorphic element shown in panels F and G is expressed um, similarly and monomorphically in the anterior part of the abdomen. But the dimorphic element is expressed um, only in females, thereby repressing pigmentation in the posterior. And so what Williams et al. showed is that this dimorphic element contains, predicted binding, or contains binding sites for abdominal B and double sex, which gets activated in females and repressed in males. So what I think is happening is that Drosophila serrata has maybe evolved a female-specific allele in the same type of way that we've seen in bric a where um, females have maybe gained pigmentation, this novel dark allele, by gaining abdominal B and double sex binding sites without passing through an intermediate phase of monomorphic gene expression in both sexes. But as I mentioned earlier, serrata isn't the only species that shows female-limited color dimorphism. So we teamed up with John Poole and Amir Yassin at the University of Wisconsin to study pigmentation in these other species shown here in red, Burla, Leontia, and Kikawai. So we took a similar approach where we integrated um, the dark allele into the light background for multiple generations, anywhere between 10 and 33. And then we sequenced both parental strains as well as pools of the light introgression and dark introgression flies. And what we found is that um, there's an excess allele frequency divergence between these two uh, lines 
in the region of PDM3. So scaffolds containing PDM3 seem to be most divergent between these light and dark intergression lines in all three species. However, as I said earlier in Serato, there were two different alleles that differed in size and sequence. And so these gels on the right is showing that I don't find similar um, evidence of a, two alleles in light and dark females in Burla, Leontia, and Kikawai. Furthermore, if we look for shared variants between Leontia and Kikawai, who are close relatives, um, what you can see on this plot on the bottom right here is that many of the shared variants between Leontia and Kikawai fall upstream of PDM3. Um, as opposed to in it, where these asterisks show the uh, alleles that we found, or the SIMPs that we found in Serrata. So we think that there have been potential multiple origins of PDM3 alleles involved in female limited pigmentation. So my current hypothesis is that Serrata has evolved female pigmentation through the activator model, where it's gained a sex specific allele in females from the outset. And my prediction is that we'll find the same thing as we map the nucleotides that are important for Kiko and Leontia. These species have light males compared to Drosophila burleigh, where males are dark. So I think burleigh may have potentially evolved female limited color dimorphism through a silencer model. So as we get the nucleotides, I think we'll be able to answer both which of these models occurs more frequently and why is it dependent on the ancestral state. And then also, what types of alleles or elements are creating female-specific um, pigmentation? So I just kind of want to end on one uh, interesting question that's been looming over me for a while, which is why are there two color morphs in the first place for females? So I don't have a great answer, but I'll present some data that we have that might suggest a hint of what might be going on. So Steve Chenoweth has a nice latitudinal collection for Drosophila serrata. Um, and we were able to look at the frequency of the light and dark color morphs in this population sample. And so what you can see is the dark morph shown here, its frequency on the right, it's basically absent in the northern populations where it's hot and humid in Australia. But in the south where the weather is cooler and the climate's colder and there's more seasonality, you see more dark flies. So potentially um, the environment does seem to maybe correlate with uh, frequency of the color morphs. There's some nice work by Dr. Parkash showing that in other species, Drosophila jambolina and Drosophila kikoi, that have this female emitted color polymorphism, that dark females may actually survive better and longer when conditions are really dry. So in these desiccation assays, um, light females didn't survive as long as dark females, suggesting there may be some fitness advantage for being dark. So as I've tried to figure out what PDM3 is doing in Drosophila serrata, I made the observation that PDM3 seems to be expressed in the enocytes, and as you heard earlier, these are cells that secrete cuticular hydrocarbons. So the enocytes here I'm showing in the white arrows. And so with um, a graduate student in the lab, Igo Lu, we have um, looked at the expression of, or the amount of cuticular hydrocarbons in both light and dark um, Drosophila serrata from our intergression cross. I'm showing just a cartoon drawing of these chromatograms here. But what we found is that the dark females had 30% more hydrocarbons in total amount than light females. And they did this primarily by varying one diene, C27-2. Interestingly, Steve Chenoweth, um, in another independent experiment in 2003, showed that females had better mating success when they had lower amounts of this hydrocarbon. So it's intriguing that dark females have more of this hydrocarbon um, compared to the light females. But as I mentioned earlier, we had this intergression population, and so we were able to use that by making homozygous lines, and then to test whether um, PDM3 might be responsible for this difference that we're seeing in um, cuticular hydrocarbons, since it is expressed in the enocytes. So when we make these homozygous lines and test them for um, uh, their cuticular hydrocarbon content, we find that dark females indeed look like the dark parents. So they also have more. Um, hydrocarbons, and they do it by increasing this 27 diene. So potentially, PDM3 is either acting um, pleiotropically on both pigmentation and hydrocarbons, or very closely linked to loci are involved. So we hope to get down to the bottom of this and figure out how um, PDM3 might be affecting cuticular hydrocarbons and potentially desiccation. So our hope is by studying both the mechanism of how and why these um, alleles become sex specific, we'll be able to understand how female limited color dimorphism has evolved. So I just want to thank my co-authors, my lab members, undergraduates, and the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak today. I'll take questions. Thank you.
So that was really interesting. I have a question about the dominance. So I was surprised. I thought there would be a fairly simple relationship between your hypotheses of an activator versus a suppressor and dominance, but that doesn't seem to be true. Do you have any thoughts about that? What were you finding in If you show the slide with all the, um, where it says which alleles are dominant and which ones, that one will do, I guess. OK. Um, if I remember correctly, so Serrata is an activator. Was that one the one where the male, where the dark allele was dominant or recessive? The dark allele is dominant. Right, and so that's consistent with the idea that a dominant is a gain of function, whereas the silencer model, you might think it's a loss of function, but, but obviously not. So any thoughts about that? Yeah, so um, I guess two things. One, we think PDM3 represses pigmentation in melanogaster, but we don't know for certain that it's the same thing in the Montium subgroup. So it could be consistent with a gain of pigmentation if PDM3 we're activating pigmentation in the Montium group, um, which would be different from the uh, Milano Gasser story. Um, I also think by activating more PDM3, if it were a pigmentation repressor, the more you make of it, the more you would become dark. And if you have light and dark pigmentation, the dark might mask the light. So I think it could be consistent. Okay, I think we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you.